Hello and welcome to the Sci-Fi Critics Channel. I am Ben Bono, here to talk to you about Book 9 of Paradise Lost, or at least the first part of Book 9, since as you probably noticed in the title of this video, this is Paradise Lost Analysis Book 9 Part 1. Um, really not because I haven't had time to get through the whole book. I've read through the whole thing. Uh, it's really more a matter of that, as you know if you're reading along with me, Book 9 is the apex of this poem. And there is so much here. And we need to be very careful not to rush it. Because what's here is so valuable, so so uh, profound in uh, what Milton has to explore. Um, it's a very dense book of the poem, and uh, we need to be careful not to rush through it. So with that in mind, I want to offer you part one today, and hopefully, again, no promises, because we all know how that goes, but uh, hopefully a little bit later in this week, I will put out part two. So what we're going to do today in part one is I am going to cover from the beginning of the book up through Adam and Eve's uh, kind of conversation that they have where they wind up splitting up. And then we'll stop there and cover the remainder of the book uh, in part two. So we'll cover the temptation narrative and everything in part two. Uh, Man, I mean, this is one of those things, I know I've said this before in the Paradise Lost videos, but um, if you read something like what Milton has done here in Book 9, and you aren't moved uh, emotionally, um, spiritually, if you're not moved by the power of his language, the sincerity with which he tells this uh, uh, narrative, then I don't think you understand literature. You know, it's one of those things where... Uh, What's going on here is so profound. Um, I honestly think that Book 9 of Paradise Lost, you could make a very strong conversation for it being the greatest work of English literature ever written. Uh, you know, obviously there's plenty of other contenders. I'm not saying that that's definitively the position that I would take. But it's certainly up there. You know, certainly Paradise Lost as a whole is one of the greatest works of English literature ever written. But if we were to, you know, just narrow that in a little bit more, Book Nine in and of itself is a masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. So, let's kind of work through this. Uh, so again, what we're going to cover, we'll cover, uh, I want to talk about some of the way that Milton opens this book. I want to talk about Satan's soliloquy. Uh, that takes place that really not only cements what we've seen before with his tragedy but brings it to a whole new level and then I want to spend a fair amount of time breaking down the conversation between Adam and Eve that whole back and forth because I think that we need to to really appreciate what Milton is doing there and the way that that argument develops and the way that he thematically continues and develops certain themes that we've seen him employ before, we need a very careful reading of that section, okay? So I'm going to hope to give you that. Uh, you know, the book starts not quite with an invocation of the muse, like what we've seen before uh, in, in a few different books, uh, 1, 3, and 7, if I'm not misremembering. But with kind of this, uh, what I'm going to call this heraldic quality that Milton employs here, where he wants us to stop in the narrative and appreciate the grandeur of what he's doing. So he starts out in line one, No more talk where God or angel guest with man as with his friend familiar to us to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the while venial discourse unbalmed. So, everything we've seen, it's done. You know, that conversation's done. We are now moving into a new phase of the narrative. I now must change these notes to tragic. Foul distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man, revolt and disobedience, 
on the part of heaven now alienated, distance and distaste, anger, just rebuke, and judgment given that brought into this world a world of woe, Sinny, sin and her shadow death, and misery, death's harbinger, sad task. I, you know, I, I think this type of storytelling is unfamiliar to us in our world of spoilers. You know, we don't want spoilers or anything when we read his story. We don't want to know what's going to happen. And here Milton not only fully expects us to know every beat of the narrative going in, he then, as we come to the most significant portion of what he wants to tell, he tells us it up front. It's a very different way of, of approaching narrative than uh, what you get in the narratives of pop, cult, pop culture, whether it be in book or television or movie or whatever. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate we're not familiar with this way of storytelling uh, because this is very valuable uh, because it gets that whole guesswork out of the way. You know, there's no sense that even if you're somebody who's, you know, lived under a rock and you've never read Genesis before, you read those lines and you aren't going to be sitting here through this book going, oh crap. Adam and Eve gonna, you know, are they actually gonna do it? Are they actually gonna eat the, eat the fruit? It's like no, uh, the ambiguity is not there. This is, um, this is is going to happen. The fall is going to happen, and everything that you know is going to happen in this book then is laid out, and so our attention is not drawn on what's going to happen. It's drawn on then being witness to the fall of man. We pay witness through this, as we've talked about before, this kind of liturgical um, movement that Milton has going on in this work. We're drawn into our duty to witness the fall of Adam and Eve and in the minds of Milton and Christian theology, our own fall along with that. We witness the origins of our sinful state in at least a mythological form. Okay? Very important, um, very powerful, and, and uh, a very lost, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, form of storytelling. All right, so then we get to Satan's soliloquy. And if you'll notice, Satan is said to circle the earth for seven days. Uh, and I don't think that's an accident, of course. I, I think that this is meant to be a parallel to the seven days of creation. Satan is going to undertake an act of uncreation, or at least that is his goal at, at this point. Uh, and he seems aware of that. You know, he's... Um, I'm going to read an excerpt that I want to say a few more things about it before I get into it. But certainly that point is kind of driven home that Satan is, we've just witnessed not in the last book, but in book seven, uh, the seven days of creation. Now we are going to witness Satan's action of uncreation. So Satan gives a soliloquy, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, of course, because it's quite long. Uh, but I do want to read a couple of excerpts from it. And uh, this first one, I want you to note that he is, e even more explicitly than we've seen before, very aware that he's not going to win. He is very aware that he is now a tragic figure and that he has accepted that tragedy, in fact, cannot escape that tragedy, and victory is hopeless, the most he can do is seek to uncreate. And you'll, you'll notice that this is kind of, he's been progressing to this point of self-awareness from the beginning of the poem, right? So when we kind of, in those first two books, we have the Council of Demons, there's almost a sense where Satan isn't aware of this, or certainly some of the demons aren't aware of this, but there's this debate of just how much can we do? Should we do nothing? Should we try again to invade heaven? Then we go even further back into his story in books five and six and see that there was a point where Satan thought he could beat God. And now he's on exactly the opposite uh, mindset. He, If he was in complete naivety in books five and six with the war in heaven, and I think we have to say he was, 
uh, I mean, within the world of the poem, certainly, uh, Milton's God is unbeatable. You know, the only reason the battle lasts as long as it does is because God kind of takes a step back, and even the sun is held back, and then the sun, when he steps into the battle, it's game over, instantly. Uh, so certainly Satan is in a very naive point there, and then chronologically within the story, we go back to book one, and he there's doubt, there's ambiguity, ambiguity. we're going to have this debate, and we kind of see Satan every time he has one of these soliloquies, we see him progress further and further along the passage of self-awareness until we get to this point where I think at this point in the narrative, the lights are completely on. He knows exactly what he is doing. He has no naivete anymore in his actions. And he, he is fully aware um, that he can never accomplish what he set out to accomplish. And the best they can do is this uncreation. So starting in line 119, going through line 157, this is Satan speaking. The more I see pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me. See, there's that awareness of that tragic state. As from the hateful siege of contraries, all good to me becomes bane, and in heaven much worse would be my state. Uh, I mean, think about that level of self-awareness. And, and he's right, to a certain extent. I mean, that would be a, a point of debate. Is he right? Um, putting aside the question of redemption, which we know from God's discussion with the Son in Book 3 uh, is not available to Satan in actuality. Um, but if by some chance Satan was able to go back to heaven after everything that's happened, would he actually be, would he be more miserable for him? And I think that there's a good case to make that, at least within the world of the poem, that would be the case. Uh, so, in heaven much worse would be my state, but neither here seek I, no, nor in heaven to dwell, unless by mastering heaven supreme. In other words, the only way I'm going back is if I kick God, but, you know, and it's not going to happen. Nor hope to be myself less miserable, but what I seek, but others to make such as I, though thereby worse to me redound. You know, think about that. The, to what I seek, but others to make such as I. I'm done. I'm down for the count. All I want is to drag others down with me, right? For only in destroying I find ease, there's that act of uncreation, to my relentless thoughts, and him destroyed or won to what may work his utter loss, for whom all this was made, all this will soon follow, as to him linked in weal or woe, in woe then, that destruction wide may range to me shall be the glory soul among the infernal powers. In one day to have marred what he, almighty styled, six nights and days continued making. And who knows how long before had been contriving, though perhaps not longer than since I in one night freed from servitude and glorious, well nigh half the angelic name, and thinner left the throne of his adorers, he to be avenged, and to repair his numbers thus impaired, whether such virtue spent on old now failed more angels to create, if they at least are his created, or despite us more, determined to advance into our room, a creature formed of earth, and him and Tao exalted from so base original, with heavenly spoils, our spoils, what he decreed, he effected, man he made, and for him built magnificent this world, and earth his seat, him Lord pronounced, and O oh, indignity, subjected to his service angel wings, and flaming ministers to watch and tend they your earthly charge. Uh, so you see in that number of things, and let's remember, uh, to really drive home the point of Satan's level of awareness, that God pretty much said, let's go make humans to kind of flip the bird at, at the demons, you know, let, let's do this as an act of kind of, you know, it's not quite as malicious as Satan paints it here, but where he talks about how, you know, has he been contriving this because of what I did? Well, that's very much the motive that God himself proclaims earlier in the poem, I believe in book six or maybe the beginning of book seven, for doing exactly what he does. Right? So, Satan is on the mark here as far as his level of awareness. There's not a lot of naivety here. And even when he, 
you know, there's that line in here where he says that, uh, to me shall be the glory among the infernal powers. That's right around line 135, if you want to check it out. You know, it's even there. It's like, okay, I'm not so much, you know, let's go hell, I won one for the team. It's that, no, I'm doing this for myself so that when I go back to hell, I can tell all of them, look what I did and look at the glory I won for myself, okay? But it gets even more so than that, because in the second excerpt I want to read, a little shorter one, uh, in lines 163 to 178, Satan is also very aware of the negative and destructive effects his actions have already had on himself and are going to continue to have. And that's even more profound. It's like his self-awareness goes to the point where it's not... Well, you know, all I can do is, is destroy things now. It's that, no, what I've done up till now has been horrible for me, and what I'm about to do is also going to be horrible for me, and with my eyes completely open, do I go forward? And we're going to see as we get into Adam and Eve's dialogue that that's going to be a major theme in this first part of the poem as we get to the clash of these two. You know, we have Satan section, we have Adam and Eve section, and then those two collide in what we'll cover in part two um, of, the, of book nine. And I think part of what Milton is trying to do in both cases is remove any excuses. What they do, they do with their eyes open. Okay? So, Again, line 163. O foul descent that I who erst contended with gods to sit the highest am now constrained into a beast and mixed with bestial slime. This essence to incarnate and in brute that to the height of deity aspired. But what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Who aspires must down as low as he, as high he soared, obnoxious first or last to basest things, Revenge at first, though sweet, bitter ere long, back on itself recoils. And listen to what he says after that thought. So revenge at first, though sweet, bitter ere long, back on itself recoils. Let it. I reck not so at light well aimed, since higher I fall short on him who next provokes my envy. This new favorite of heaven, this man of clay, son of despite, whom us the more to spite his maker raised from dust spite than with spite is best repaid. I mean, think about that. It's like he has this moment of self-awareness where he's reflecting on, I was here and now I'm here, you know, in this body of a serpent and now I'm going to go try and have revenge. What does revenge do? Well, it feels good at first, but it eventually destroys you. And let it. You know, those two words right there, if there's any doubt of the fact that Satan is, again, going into this eyes open. Those two words remove any ambiguity. Okay? Uh, the effect of this is going to be bad. Let it. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Then you have, of course, the use of language in here, you know, just the sheer beauty of Milton's words. I mean, uh, Satan's soliloquy at the beginning of this book is uh, absolute masterpiece. Absolute masterpiece. So then from there, um, you know, Satan then is locked in. He is going into the temptation narrative in the second half of the book, eyes open. How about Adam and Eve? Well, let's get to them. So, it's time to get to work. In the morning, got to take care of the Garden of Eden. And Eve says, hey, Adam, we got a lot to do. How about we split up? Uh, and we'll find out that Eve actually has some ulterior motives behind that, or at least some naivete uh, fueling her desire to kind of part ways here, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So I want to just walk through this dialogue between them with a series of short excerpts uh, and really kind of slowly develop the logic of what they're talking about and what's going on here. So Eve says, 
we can get more done together than apart. Uh, Adams says, not such a good idea, and that's where we'll start with this first one. So at first he says, you know, okay, sometimes it's nice to have some alone time. You know, that's a rough paraphrase of Milton. Uh, so being in line 248, to short absence I could yield, you know, that's a, yeah, it could be nice to have some alone time for sol solitude. Sometimes it's best society and short retirement or just sweet return, right? Uh, isn't that sweet? It's good to have a little time alone, right? But other doubt possesses me, lest harm befall thee severed from me. For thou knowest what hath been warned us, what malicious foe, envying our happiness, and of his own despairing, seeks to work us woe and shame by sly assault. And somewhere night hand watches, no doubt, with greedy hope to find his wish and best advantage us asunder. So, couple things here to note. We've had opening salvos from both parties of this dialogue. And, well, a few things to know. Number one, it's going to be fascinating. It is a bit fascinating to note that pre-fallen Adam and Eve have something of an argument here. So make of that what you will as far as Milton's assessment of the pre-fallen state. Uh, which, of course, certainly isn't necessarily a contradiction of anything in a Christian orthodoxy. We don't, we cannot can comprehend the pre-fallen state, really. You know, the closest we would get within uh, Christian theology, of course, would be the person of Jesus, who has arguments all the time. Uh, you could take into account there that the second party in the argument is, is already fallen, um, so that accounts for Jesus engaging in oftentimes very hostile arguments. Uh, so what happens when two members of the pre-fallen state or unfallen state uh, disagree? You know, that's obviously an area of ambiguity. The other way you could look at it, though, is that at this point in the dialogue, there hasn't been a disagreement yet. When the disagreement comes in, Eve, where does Eve fall exactly? Does the fall begin before she actually sins? You know, is the fall a moment where she takes the fruit and eats it? Or is it a process that is actually starting now? And I think we almost have to say both. Because obviously there is the moment within the narrative. Eve has not disobeyed God until she eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so there is a singular moment within the narrative, and indeed within the Genesis narrative, where sin happens. But yet, there's also bordering kind of on both sides of that, the lead up to sin and the aftermath of sin. In other words, it, even though sin is this singular moment, it's not the case that Eve just wanders up to the tree Satan says, have an apple. Eve says, okay, and we're done. Uh, what we're going to see in this dialogue is an overturning of the pre-fallen or unfallen order uh, that will eventually lead to sin in part two of this book. And, and, and along with that, it's important to note from the top here uh, of this dialogue that, as we've talked about in previous books, the order that Milton wants us to understand is God, Adam, Eve. You can disagree with that feminist from a feminist perspective or what have you. That's fine. But for the logic of this book, we have to accept it. You know, we have to accept that that's what Milton is getting at. He's not making a statement here devaluing women, though from a feminist perspective, uh, we might say that that happens regardless of what he intends, but I want to again press us to before we launch into any critiques from a modern, per, from the perspective of our modern 21st century politics and uh, social values, we need to first accept what Milton is doing within his own world and for that we need to go along with that as the hierarchy of this narrative and see why Milton treats that as important. Okay, so Eve, I want to let's break off. Adam, no bad idea. Remember that Satan's out there. 
doing what Satan does. Which is nothing good as a general rule. But Eve does not take that warning from Adam very well. Uh, he, she takes it quite personally, actually. Rightfully or wrongly. So starting in line 273. Line 273. This is Eve speaking then to Adam. Offspring of heaven and earth and all earth's Lord, that such an enemy we have who seeks our ruin, both by thee informed I learn, and from the parting angel overheard, as in a shady nook I stood behind, just then returned at shot of evening flowers. In other words, Eve saying, look, Adam, I know, you know, I'm not an idiot. I didn't forget that. I know that Satan's out there. But that thou shouldst my firmness therefore doubt to God or thee, because we have a foe may tempt it. I expected not to hear. His violence thou fearest not, being such as we, not capable of death or pain, can either not receive or can repel his fraud. And then thy fear, which plain infers, thy equal fear, that my firm faith and love can by his fraud be shaken or seduced. In other words, so Adam... If you're worried about this, it can't be that he's going to kill kill me because we can't die. So it must be you think he's going to drag me into disloyalty. Thought uh, thy equal firm that my firm faith and love can be his fraud and be shaken or seduced. Thoughts which now found their harbor in thy breast, Adam, misthought of her to thee so dear. Um... And what, it's such a well-written moment because it has a strong type of logic even though we know what's going to happen. Like, we know that Adam's right. Don't split up. This is a really bad idea. We also know Eve's logic is flawed. That she can be destroyed by Satan. And in fact, will be. Uh... But yet, what she, there's this internal logic to what she says where it's like, okay, you know, what's the problem here? Don't you trust me? You know, so it, it, it makes a type of sense. And Adam says, uh, you know, and then he, it's, it, Milton says he speaks healing words to her that she, it's not that she's weak. Uh, but the, the danger is very, very real. So we can't do this. It's not that, you know, you're the problem or anything. It's just a bad idea. Okay. So we're not quite at disagreement yet. Totally. You know, Eve's getting there. Um, I think if Eve stops right now, there's not a problem. There's not a problem. She says, okay, I get it. You're right. Let's not do this. But now she pushes the argument further. So she insists that if they can't survive this test, and this is where I think Eve go. if you want to make a case that Eve falls before that moment, it's right here. Because she asserts that if they, if in fact Satan is able to seduce them, God made her imperfectly. Okay, and that ex the acceptance of that logic, if you want to make a case that there's a moment of the fall before the actual moment of the fall, it's right here. Line 326. How are we happy still in fear of him? This is Eve speaking, by the way. But harm precedes not sin. Only our foe tempting affronts us with his foul esteem of our integrate... Inter... I don't know... I've might have that written down wrong, but of whatever. His foul esteem sticks no dishonor on our front, but turns foul on himself. Then wherefore, shunned or feared by us, who rather double honor gain from his surmise prove false. Find peace within favor from heaven, our witness from the event, and what is faith, love, virtue unassayed, alone without exterior help sustained. Let us not then suspect our happy state, left so imperfect by the maker wise as not secure to single or combined frail is our happiness if this be so and eden were no eden thus exposed 
Um, and I think we're going to note in part two that Satan's own logic in this conversation parallels the logic that Eve uses here. So in other words, her logic says, if we can fall, it's God's fault. But that's not how she presents it. What she, the way she presents it is, we can't fall because God wouldn't do that. Okay, so it's this twisting of the negative to sound positive. Uh, and, and this, if we can still make an excuse for Eve that this isn't malicious, this is simply mistaken, okay? So, at this point, if Eve leaves right now, the temptation happens and she eats, she could still be excused for walking into it. In other words, she'd still sin, but her eyes aren't open. But we have one more piece of dialogue here because Adam refutes the flaw in her logic. And at that point, all the cards are on the table. Okay, so her first flawed logic is, you don't want to split up because you just think I'm weak. Adam says, no, that's not the case. Okay, the, her flawed logic has been... Um, refuted there, but now this is the much stronger point. Uh, if we fail, it's because God made us bad and this Eden isn't really an Eden. And when Adam is about, as Adam refutes that logic in kind of the longest section from this dialogue I, I want to read, uh, Eve no longer will have an excuse at that point. Okay, so let's just read this. So, two things are going to happen. First, Adam, again, refute the logic, but then second, he's going to give her the freedom to make her choice. So, beginning in line 343. O woman, best are all things as the will of God ordained them. His creating hand, nothing imperfect or deficient left of all that he created. Much less happy man, or aught that might his happy state secure, or secure from outward force. In other words, um, Okay, Eve, you just said that if we fall, it's because God didn't make us perfectly. And Adam's saying there is no chance that is the case. There is no possibility, whatever happens, there's no possibility that that's true. We take as a given, as a pre, you know, prerequisite to our thinking, that God uh, did not create us fallen. Or God did not create us flawed so that we would... Uh, fall as a result of his ineptitude, okay? Within himself, meaning within man, the danger lies, yet lies within his power. Against his will, he can receive no harm. In other words, man is completely free to avoid harm. But God left free the will, for what obeys reason is free. And reason he made right, but bid her well beware, and let still erect least by some fair appearing good surprise she dictate false and misinform the will to do what god expressly hath forbid not then mistrust but tender love enjoins that i should mind thee oft and mind thou me in other words this is again going back to that first point eve made it's not that you're weak it's that we need to do this for each other i need to take care of you you need to take care of me Firm we subsist, yet possible to swerve, since reason not impossibly may meet some specious object by the foes suborned and fallen to deception unaware, not keeping strictest watch as she was warned. Seek not temptation then, which to avoid were better, and most likely, if from me, thou sever not. Trial will come unsought, which thou approve thy constancy, approve first thy obedience." That's going to be important. We'll talk about that in a second. The other who can know, not seen the attempted who attest. But if thou think trial unsought may find us both secure than thus warned thou seems go. For thy stay, not free, absence thee more. Go in thy native innocence, rely. Go in thy native innocence, rely on what thou hast of virtue, summon all. For God towards thee hath done his part do thine. So again, this goes back to this hierarchy thing for a second. God, because what Adam says of God is, no, God made us free, 
He gave us all the tools to survive, but he also made us free. And now Adam, in the second part of that, exactly mirrors that logic. I'm going, I'm now giving you all the information. I'm giving you, uh, not quite a command, but very close to it. You know, because he uses that word obey that I, I noted. You know, I, I'm giving you everything you need to survive what's going on here in the garden. To survive the temptation. To survive, we don't split up. But you are free. I will not make you stay against your will. Therefore, do what you want. Obey me or leave. It's your choice. And of course, Eve chooses to leave. Uh, and you have to note that that moment where she leaves is, again, a moment where you could say that she falls because she has all the cards are on the table. Adam lays everything out. He has refuted her faulty logic about God, about herself, about his own motives. He has said, you need to stay, need not in the sense of I command you, but that your need is to stay with me as my need is to stay with you, but you are free to walk away from this hierarchy that God has created to protect us from God to me to you. And then he walks away. And so at this moment, whether or not we want to say Eve has fallen yet, and again, there is that singular moment where sin happens. Uh, so I have no qualm with saying she isn't fallen. But what I do want to insist on saying is that the created order is now disrupted and the fall is, is inevitable. It will happen. The last chance to avoid it was for Eve to stay with Adam. And the second she walks away, the fall becomes inevitable within the logic of the narrative. And uh, again, Milton then kind of uses these heraldic qualities in, in the last few lines here that I'm going to read before we pause for the end of part one of this discussion. Um, and he says in line 406 to 411, Thou never from this that hour in paradise foundest either sweet repast or sound repose, such ambush hid among sweet flowers and shades, weighted with hellish rancor, imminent to intercept thy way, he's speaking to Eve here, uh, or send thee back, despoiled of innocence, of faith, of bliss. In other words, never from that hour found found a sweet repast. It's over, is in a sense what Milton's saying, is that, okay, we haven't sinned yet, but it's over. The game is up. Uh, it's just a matter of running out the clock at this point. That's all Satan has to do. Very powerful stuff, very powerful stuff. So uh, I hope I'll be able to uh, get through all of the rest of Book 9 in uh, Part 2. Uh, of this, but I think this is a good stopping point because, um, of course, we need to make sure we have plenty of time for the temptation narrative itself. I don't want to rush through that. Uh, there's also a couple of moments leading up to that I really want to spend some time on. So, uh, not my desire to draw out these videos more than necessary, but it is my desire to uh, be thorough and uh, to do a good job with this discussion if for my, no one else but myself, but hopefully you're enjoying it as well. Uh, so I'll be back hopefully later this week with part two, and we will read the end of this most excellent and masterful book nine. But for now, I am Benji Bono, and this is a sci-fi Christian. I will see you next time. Bye.